So last week, Deacon Tom reminded us that John was all about tough love and repentance. John was urging us to return to the covenant and return to God, to put ourselves fully under the water of baptism and to come up changed. Beloved, reconciled. John is standing in front of us today holding a sign that says, stop looking at me. Look over there. Last week, Deacon Tom said, in baptism, we aren't called to be the Lord, but we are called to ministry, to love others, to be followers of Christ. John is standing with two of his own disciples, and John directs their attention to Jesus and says, look, here is the Lamb of God. And there's an exclamation point at the end of that sentence. This is important. This is worth hearing loudly. This means something. And John's disciples leave him and follow Jesus. That's our job too. Whomever we are following, whatever great thing we talk about all the time, for me it's TV shows, FYI. Whenever and wherever we are, at any given time, we are called. And our best response is to stop what we're doing and follow Jesus. And to be prepared to have Jesus ask us, what are you looking for? Not who are you looking for, not how can I help you, but Jesus asks us, what are you looking for? And when they answer, Jesus says, come and see. Come be part of what it is you're looking for. Be ministry. Be the baptized. Be the changed. The weird thing about morning prayer is everything is a little bit different. We don't stand for the gospel during morning prayer because we're not proclaiming it during a communion service. We're just reading it together as a family. Remember those t-shirts we had? Sunday morning cardio? Sit, stand, kneel. Sit, stand, kneel. Whew, that's morning prayer. It's different. And until, I just told Randy before the service started, until just a few minutes ago, I forgot it was right two because I'm so used to right one. Oops. And the other odd thing about a morning prayer service is it's supposed to be led by lay people. Thrilled to be your deacon. I'm thrilled Deacon Tom was here and had great words for us last week. Trinity happens to have an abundance of deacons. Our job is to show you how to do it yourselves. Look that way. Look in the mirror. I'm asking you to come and be part of what you're looking for. To that end, I'd like to read an article from 2017. It was written by Erin Wathen. She's an ordained minister Ooh, sorry, um, for the Disciples of Christ Church. And her words hit me like a ton of bricks. They colored the way I look at church. And I hope they mean a little something to you and that you're able to translate, because it's an Easter article, translate it in your mind for our Christmas services and for our search for a priest. The article is called, Your Church Does Not Need Volunteers. I was writing my weekly note to the congregation a few days late 
because I took Monday off and everything is downhill from there. Usually in this note, I share a few words about the message for Sunday so that we can all be reflecting on the same topic throughout the week. It makes the sermon more of an ongoing conversation. I sometimes discuss something that's going on in the life of the church as well. But this week, it was more of a thank you note. Because when I think about how much work my church folks did over the last few weeks to get our place ready for Easter, it blows my mind. And as I look around the property, I see the fruits of many hours of shared labor. Sparkling windows and floors, finely manicured landscaping, dramatic pyramids, hung with a complex pulley system by dedicated house elves in the wee hours. And then I start thinking about the work of the worship team, the children's ministry team, the musicians, not to mention greeters, handshakers, bulletin hander outers, coffee makers, the youth group that was there hiding eggs for the little ones, plus so many more behind the scenes workers that I have not time to mention. Just thinking about it makes me overwhelmed with gratitude. It's enough to make my mascara run. I'm not crying, you are. I would love to meet this woman. That's so fun. I hear that, I feel that. In writing this note to my people, I wrote that it takes a whole village of volunteers to make all of this happen. But then I found myself hitting the backspace button because volunteer is not quite the right word for what our people do at church. I know I'm not the only one who cringes when someone sees me without kids in tow and asks if my husband is babysitting. Well, no. I mean, yes, he's at home with the kids, but I don't think you can effectively say babysitting when it's your own dang kid. I'd say we just call that parenting. I feel the same way when te people talk about volunteering at church. And yes, I know it's just a word, but it's the wrong word for a lot of reasons. If you ask an elder at your church, I'm pretty sure they'll tell you that the church they grew up in never asked them to volunteer. Historically, the church has asked people to serve as greeters, Sunday school teachers, on the Building and Grounds Committee, whatever the job, it was consider considered a service, a ministry. The language of volunteerism is a pretty recent addition to the church lexicon. It has emerged with a megachurch of the last few decades, and the culture in which small to moderate-sized churches replicate the language and practices of larger churches. Volunteering is something you're asked to do right off the bat. It helps get folks engaged, and that's a good thing. Maybe you give them a flashy name badge that says volunteer in big red letters. This identifies you as someone who's there to help, one who can answer questions, give directions, or generally point you toward the donuts. That's a good thing. But I balk at the secular nature of what it means to volunteer. To volunteer means that you are an outside resource, stepping in to help an organization in need. Volunteering is what we do when we pick up trash at the park, or build a house with habitat, or help sort food at a local food pantry. Volunteering is what I do at my kids' school on Fridays. In other words, it's what you do at a place that is important to you, but not at a place that belongs to you. Your own dang kid. And I guess that is the important distinction for me. You cannot volunteer at your own church in the same way that you cannot babysit your own kid. Because the church belongs to you in the same way your family does. It's your own place, your own people. So of course you help take care of it. Of course you do the yard work. Of course you make the coffee. Of course you teach the kids. You sing in the choir. And whatever else is needed, 
to make this a home for the people that you love. Jesus asked us, what are you looking for? I think we're looking for that home. Aaron continues, a volunteer in many cases is a flyby. A helpful flyby, but it's just not the same as belonging to something. It's not the same as contributing to something bigger than you, something that's a part of who you are. Maybe some practices of inordinately large churches are good ones, systems from which we can learn a great deal about connection and engagement. But ultimately, the language of volunteerism is secular and more to the point, corporate. The notion is rooted in consumer culture in which we can swoop in, give or take the measure that we deem as fit and then dart out again, feeling we have done our part. We do a disservice to our faith and to the gospel itself when we reduce the work of the church to something you can mark on a time card. All that said, we live in the world we live in, and we cannot realistically extract this word from the life of the church. It is both a noun and a verb, and it's the one that just rolls off the tongue when we are asking people to come and do work, which, in the church, we are forever asking people to do. Still, as I plan for summer sermon series on discipleship and what it means to let the church be the church, I feel a strong nudge to challenge how we talk about and think about the time and energy we spend in ministry. It's important to recognize those gifts for what they are, ministry. And I'm not sure the word volunteer does justice to the depths contained in the work people actually do in their churches. Call it serving, call it discipleship, call it the priesthood of all believers, or mission, or ministry. Admittedly, priesthood of believers does not look great on a t-shirt, and it maybe doesn't invite visitors to ask you where the bathrooms are. But whatever we do, we should remember that we don't just belong to the church, it belongs to us. And we don't babysit that which is ours. End article. In today's gospel, John is asking us not to volunteer our time, but to participate in the life of Christ. Look, here is the Lamb of God. Jesus, where are you staying? Come and see where I'm staying. John didn't hand his disciples over to Jesus to care for them. John pointed them in the direction he was going. And John's disciples knew that they had to follow Jesus to care for him, to stay with him. And in doing so, they joined the family. They got new names, and they started new ministries. They didn't volunteer for that. They stepped into the gap Jesus provided for them. That's amazing. And for the next several weeks, the Episcopal Church will be in a season of epiphany. Surprises. It's a time for mystics like John the Baptist prophets like Jesus, for being amazed by simplicity and being awed by miracles. I urge us to look for those signs that point us to the Messiah and to our own callings and to the opportunity to follow Jesus. Deacon Tom reminded us last week that John called Jesus into the water and Jesus stood in that gap on our behalf. John was tough love and repentance. Jesus is unconditional love and reconciliation. And he's inviting us to join that family, not as a flyby, but as a member, and to talk more about Jesus than about our favorite sports team. 
talk more about Jesus and the Holy Spirit's work than I do about TV shows. For us to talk more about the love of God than the love of secular things, to be ministry, to be baptized, to be changed. Amen.